My name is Chris McAuliffe. I um, actually oversee the worship ministry here, and uh, that's been a trip and a sweet privilege to be able to do that. And on occasion, um, Shane has me teach. So lucky you guys tonight. We're going to be rolling as we're just continuing in Psalms. Tonight we're doing Psalms 7 and 8. So uh, grab your Bibles, and we're going to roll through this. Um, Really, as we talk about the Psalms, um, the Psalms are fascinating, aren't they? I think it's really easy to take it just that firsthand and first glance and be like, yeah, these are just these, let's be real, kind of mostly depressing or sad poetry that have some reprise typically or occasionally have this happy, joyous psalm, these songs. But really, uh, I think there's a lot more depth to it. Something that might require us just to dig a little deeper to see what is this pointing out? Like, what is this psalm actually saying? Is this psalm like a prophecy even? Is this pointing to the future? And I think tonight, the psalms are going to do that big time. And uh, it should be a lot of fun to dive in. I'm slipping on this stool. I apologize. I'm, tr I'm trying to sit. Usually I pace or move around. So this is good for me and us. So let's just pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We just pray that this evening would be special as we just study your word, and we just want to draw something out of it that's applicable, draw something out that is, uh, that is good for us beyond just academia or just learning these facts. God, we want to take something and actually apply it to our lives. We want to be encouraged. We want to see you, Jesus, in this text. Speak through me, please, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's just jump into this. We're just going to read Psalm 7. I did not give anything for the video to uh, put on the screen, so you're going to need your Bibles tonight. We're not going to jump around too much, but we're going to do Psalm 7 and 8, and we are going to dabble in the New Testament. Um, as it turns out, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and whoever wrote Hebrews quote this. So it should be a lot of fun to jump in and just see what they say. So Psalm 7. Oh, oh Lord, in you do I take refuge. Save me from my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it into pieces with none to deliver. Oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. And let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. The Lord judges the peoples, judges me. O Lord, according to my righteous, I'm sorry, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteousness, or establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O gracious, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give thanks, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. Okay, so as I process this, there's a lot I think we can really draw out of this passage. There's a lot to consider, and we're just going to kind of jump on the things I think that kind of brought to my attention, we're going to talk about them a little bit. And you know what? This may just seem a little goofy, or I don't know if you jump on board this right way, but words are painful. 
right? Words can be very painful. This Cush, so if you read the, the first part, it says Cush the Benjamite, right? He talks about of David, which he's saying to the Lord concerning the words of Cush a Benjamite. So I was kind of reading up on this, and there's a lot of people who they're like, it could be this guy. They're not entirely sure because it turns out this is a really, really old book. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly who Cush is. Uh, it seemed like a lot of people kind of agreed mostly on um, someone in Saul's maybe cabinet or just some partisan with Saul. It could have been the King Saul when David is anointed, but King Saul's still there. Some people even think it might be Saul. I don't know. Um, but that seems to kind of be where a lot of um, people wrote commentary were headed that way. And regardless, so at this point, this person is trying to speak into David's life and in a way, in my opinion, crush his soul. Right? He accused David of something that obviously affected him negatively. Um, not entirely sure is, but we'd just say for this discussion that he's probably a partisan with Saul or he's with that person. He tried to discourage David, who's anointed, but not yet king, and uh, which is a pretty awkward situation to begin with. And that's why I was just thinking, like, words crush us. Words can have a lot of power. And that's what this person attempted to do to David, right? You can try to bring him down. You know what? I, I feel like we experience this a lot. I know that it's easy. I don't know if you guys experience this in your workplace, but it seems like there is a nature of people when you step out and try to do good work or maybe go above and beyond, you kind of draw criticism. Has anyone experienced that? You know what I'm talking about? It's for so I don't know what it is about people. They kind of want to bring it down. I'm not going to dive into that. I know you probably have all experienced this. This is something I personally thought of. It was like when you try to step out and you're like, yeah, I'm going to like work hard. I want to better myself. I want to be really good at my job and do the best I can. And there's people who are like, why would you even do that? Like, that's never going to happen or, you know, whatever. And you're like, well, like, why are you going after me? Why are we going after this? I think uh, if I could find in my notes, um, you should expect these attacks. I was reading, Pastor Shane gave me this really difficult to read old commentary. He's like, this is going to help you out. And I'm like, he, he spoketh and forth goeth to, and I'm like, Spurgeon, you're brilliant, but I just can't read you very well. I kind of had to like skim it. But he had some really sweet stuff in there. And one of his quotes that I thought was hilarious, but super applicable, was, it is only the tree laden with fruit that men throw stones. I, for some reason, we have this draw to like, the guy's doing good work, let's just kind of go after him. I don't know what that is, guys. But I think the thing to recognize is that if you are walking in a way good, or what we would say a manner worthy of your calling, which is basically Bible talk for being like, I'm just trying to be more like Jesus. That's all that means. Um, you should expect those stones. And we've talked mainly about like, well, people could throw that stuff at you. They go after you. But really what David talks about, like right after this in verse two is lest the lion tear my soul apart, rending it to pieces with none to deliver. What does the lion say to you? What say, anyone can say it. What do you think when it says lion in a biblical context? Think about it. Where else do we talk about lions? It could be anything. Oh, come on. Samson, okay, fighting the lion, ripped him in his head in half. Pretty epic. <laughs> Where else? Satan. the lion's den, right? Yeah, Satan's the thing that my mind runs to right away is that that's seeking about, right? So if Satan is that prowling lion, if you are walking in a manner worthy of your calling, do you think Satan's going to probably be there? Or you're going to have these temptations or these discouragements? I think you can assume that. Take that as an encouragement, right? Like, oh, I'm being tempted to go away from this thing that I know is good. 
take them like, I must be on the right path if this guy doesn't want me here. But I think we all struggle with this. You may not be the future anointed king of a nation going through these people like you're not fit to do whatever the thing was. You may not be that actual like spot, but you can assume that you're going to be tempted. You're going to be trying to throw them off. Uh, and honestly, guys, anxiety is huge. And I'm not, I'll talk about it just a smidge bit here. I'm not a psychologist or a learned doctor. Um, I'm not really talking about diagnosable, treatable anxiety necessarily specifically, but we all experience anxiety together. We are all gonna face it. And a lot of times I think that's from the enemy, right? And can we kind of just get in this cycle of like, you're no good. You can't do this. Everyone's experienced this. I think that's totally the enemy. And I'm just thinking about this in David's example. So I'm reading a book <clears throat> that uh, by Stephen Kotler, who's, it's, a, it's called The Art of Impossible. It's basically like, how do you maximize your time to have like the best, it's one of those books. He's got a lot of this neuroscience stuff. It's kind of a fun read of what, but he talks about, um, anxiety, and, and actually what they did is they, he, I'll just quote him, he said, anxiety inside the MRI, so a brain scan, he says, looks a little like OCD. It's a small network, it's a tight thought loop, and the brain runs circles around, its stuff with, uh, around itself with no way to stop and no new solutions. So imagine the concept, right, of your brain just spins, right? That anxiety, that drive, and you're just like, everyone's experienced this. That's kind of what your brain's doing. You're in this cycle. You don't really know how to break it. And that's totally what the enemy wants to do to you, right? Because if your brain spins, if your mind is spinning out of control and not trying to break it, it's so hard to press on. It's so hard to take those steps of faith that I think the Lord wants us to make. So it's really important to, like this can happen to us, the Psalm of David, this cry. Now, we need to like take these things to the Lord. And that's what David does here. Um, David Guzik's pastor, he writes like basically kind of in, in context of the end of this verse, uh, sorry, the end of this chapter, he said, David ends his Psalm which began in gloom on a high note of praise, right? He's like, praise the Lord, who you are righteous, you're a great heavenly father, right? He praises it, it, praises at the end of it. But he says this, he could praise because he took his cause to God and in faith left it there. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, a really fast talking young pastor came, I don't know, a few years ago. When was Ben Corson here? Anyway, he loves psychology through like Christian perspectives. And he talked about how like when you pray and you give that stuff to the Lord and you leave things in faith, they actually find that your brain responds in a way as if you're meeting with a counselor, which I think is fascinating. So anyway, I love that. So he brought it in faith and he left it there. Now we've talked about that. He got accused, he's struggling, he's hurting. And so what did David do? He basically desires justice, right? But the thing I think is so crazy, David does. Um, verse three says, oh Lord, if, if I've done this, if there's wrong in my hands, if I've repaid my friends with evil or plundered an enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. David like literally honestly is like, if the things I'm being accused of, I've done, let justice happen. Man, that is, that is let's just say this, that is interesting. I would assume that the strong-willed, powerful man, that this King David, would just be like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. I don't need, I, you just, you're just trying to get me down. I'm just, what do we say, water off a duck's back, right? I guess that's what I'd assume, but David literally takes this thoughtfully, and he's like, Lord, if I've actually done this, like, let justice happen. I'm kind of still processing that. 
to be honest. That David so, so wants to be right with the Lord, he'll even take his adversary's comments to the Lord and just be like, hey, if they're right, like, let justice happen. Yeah. And so with doing this, he, we got to remember that God handles justice. And God takes justice seriously. Verse 11, he's my, my passage, the ESV here. Sorry, Pastor Shane. He says, uh, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indig indignation every day. So when I looked up indignation, it's anger aroused by unjust. Every day. And so God wants justice. He's angered by the unjust. So we need to leave justice in his hands. Really difficult to do. Easy to say, difficult to do. But he talks about all these things like God's like, if they don't repent, God's going to wet his sword. Basically, he's going to sharpen the sword. He's going to get the bow, stretch it out, point it at him. And God, this picture of God is ready to lay down the law. And he, this is how David honestly describes God, this righteous anger. And I think we need to trust God with that because you know what? When we focus on things that are out of our control, I think we kind of go insane. Does that make sense? If you are like so wanting the justice to happen to someone who wronged you, Man, like we have a judicial system in our country, right? And that's, that does its thing. But what I'm talking about is like this actual justice from the Lord. Like we can't make it happen. That is all God's game. It says that throughout scripture, justice, vengeance is mine. Justice belongs to the Lord. So basically what I'm trying to say is if you are infatuated with it, like it controls you, we get bitterness, we get upset, we get just so hyper-focused on this thing that we tend to forget the other things that God has put in our lives that actually matter, right? I think the human mind, we would literally, I'll say this again, I think we go insane when we focus on this too much because our brains, we can't handle it, and our, we like to get things done, at least I do. And so if I'm focused on something that is actually impossible for me to take care of, that can't be good. It tends to take away from things like your family, talking like your immediate family, things we've been entrusted with, maybe ta a talent God has given you that you aren't making excellent. Your finances, things the Lord has given you as possession, maybe a home, whatever it is. You guys can kind of think, you can what I'm saying, right? If we can pray and leave, honestly be like, God, justice belongs to you, and actually leave it there, we can focus on the things God actually really wants us to focus on. I think that's huge. So just closing that psalm, that's kind of where I'm at. That's kind of what I got out of it. Like I said, we're just going to quote that again, what Guzik said, because it's money. Verse 17 of chapter 7 says, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. David ended his psalm, which began in gloom with a high note of praise. He could praise because he took this cause to, the, to God and in faith left it there. That's pretty money. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the life hack or this book I'm reading of all this psychology stuff, I'm like, dude, like, if you just do what the Lord tells you to do, like, your brain functions so well. It's super cool, right? Did you know that, like, Jesus, that the Lord, I'm not trying to life hack or give you life pointers because I think that the word of God is alive and active and I believe in the Holy Spirit and a spiritual realm and a God who wants you right with him. But what I do see in a lot of scripture is when we actually like do as he says, a lot of times there are other benefits because the God who wrote this Bible, the God who is has a redemptive plan for us, is the guy who also wired our brains. 
And so as we follow his word, I think there is a lot of really sweet benefits. Last chapter 7, pretty sweet so far, but let's go to, let's do Psalm 8. This will be a lot of fun. This will be our last show. We're just going to knock out two tonight, and we'll see how this shouldn't go too long. I'm not the best at this. So Psalm 8, let's read it. Okay, so, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? in the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Mm. This one's fun. So this one's quoted a bunch in the New Testament, which I maybe first time you read it, you're like, okay. Starts out like a good song, right? It says, to the choir master, according to the, the Giddith, which people have ideas what that means, but it's hard to know because this is a very old book. A Psalm of David. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So it's like, okay, cool. What's a good start to a nice song? Like, we've sing this song, right? We sing songs that have these lines in it. This is a really popular thing. But when you read this, you're like, okay, cool. The mouths of babies, that's strength. All right. Cool. I think I might see something in the middle about the Son of Man and you crown him with glory and honor. That might say something about Jesus. That's cool. But, like... I don't know. This is kind of a funny thing to process. You wouldn't think that multiple places in the New Testament this is quoted, right? So Psalms have a lot of depth to them, which is pretty cool. But let's kind of take this into context maybe of we kind of cheat. Because, I'll say cheat. We have the whole scriptures, and we know that Jesus came, and that's God's mystery that was revealed to us. And Jesus came down to earth as a man experienced life, lived it fully, lived it perfectly, and was now the sacrificial lamb that could die on the cross, rise again from the dead, and then conquer death, and we could be redemptive and work in his plan, right? So we kind of have that cheat to this. So when we read the beginning of these Psalms, like Psalms 2, which we remember we watched that Bible Project video that said actually these Psalms have five books, and there's actually a bit more rhythm to the, where they're placed. It's not just like, here's a cool Psalm, or like how some people write albums where they're like, wow, we've written like three depressing songs. Let's try to throw in a happy one here. Like, you know, it's not written like that. It's got a lot more depth to it. So let's read it in the context maybe of someone more when this was written who didn't quite know that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. So Psalms 2 is a big deal, and it really talks about this... Um, the Lord's anointed king. If you look at the title, it says the Lord's anointed king in my Bible. And he kind of, the author writes, and he says that um, in verse 1, like, why do the nations rage? The people plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And then the next line is, he who sits in heaven laughs. And we basically kind of get this idea of this like anointed king who's like, <laughs> all y'all can get together, but it's not going to work because I'm, the, I'm the, the holy and the Lord's anointed king. Like nothing you can bring against me can defeat this. There's laughter there. So you have that in context. And maybe what it's been described as me, if you were reading this back in the day, let's say, before Jesus, you'd have been like, well, David had that anointed thing. Maybe it's King David, right? You might think that in your head, kind of. And then, uh, but all of a sudden, think Psalm 1 and 2 is like the prelude, and then episode 1 is, uh, book 1 is Psalms 3, and it opens up with uh, Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom's son. 
So you're like, David's gonna be this anointed king, right? He's pretty awesome. And then the first scene is David enters in scene left running for his life. And you're like, I don't know if that really matches the picture here. Like this is a little funky, but okay, let's press on. And you see David as he continues to write, honestly, like I, I see, if you just look at these titles, we're not gonna dive into everything. Shane's already covered some of this, these, these passages, but it's like, De desperate like save me save me oh god answer me deliver my life and seven we covered like be my refuge so i don't know you kind of get this little different image right you're like okay well maybe david maybe this is a little different maybe it's not david um <clears throat> And then things get a little funky when you read. You finally get to chapter 8, and verse 2 says, Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength. They're like, that's strange. <laughs> I don't always think of a baby and an infant as, like, when I think powerful and strength, I don't, I don't think of babies. I've got one. I've had a, like, my kids are, like, three and one, and I don't think of, like, <laughs> the strength or, like, from this is gonna be like the anointed king, right? That's not, that's kind of a, it should be a little goofy to you. That's okay to read something in the scripture and be like, that's, I don't know. Like, you know, then that's totally okay to think. When you have those questions, kind of like process it. Process it with the scriptures and it's actually a really fun time. Okay, so, Open up with Psalms is a bit of a struggle. We're trying to figure out who this king, this anointed king is. There's babies who are the strength of everything somehow. And then we move on to three through there. And it's talking about, I was just thinking like, man, this is in my mind is man and light of the universe. <laughs> Let's just make it simple like that. Like when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've set in place. What is man? Right? When you go out at night and you look at the stars and you're like, especially if you're away from light pollution and you get dizzy almost. Have you ever felt that? You're like, my eyes can't even focus on the depth of however far I'm looking. It makes you feel small and that's okay. That's good. But it also makes you feel like hopeful, peaceful. You can kind of contemplate things, right? So anyway, you're thinking of this, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden you look down at man, which we aren't like, man's pretty cool. Human beings are cool. We are made in the image of God. I'm not trying to poo-poo that at all. In fact, we'll talk more into that. But like really, at the beginning of Genesis, you kind of look at us of like, uh, these, we're these fleshy dirt creatures, right? We kind of come out of the dirt and then get life breathed into us, right? And that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of the context painted here in a way. But he says like, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yeah, you've made him a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with honor and glory. And I think what we're hitting home here is man in the image of God, and that is a big deal to him. That's really important. You see that we're kind of in this spot. We've got the animals, we've got the angels, and we've got humanity. And I think there's a reason that God, this author, David, didn't just write like, we're just above the animals. He said, we're just below the angels. Being made in the image of God is important. It should affect, I think, how we look at each other, how we care and take care of one another. I think it really should affect that kind of stuff. It's not even like, this person's in need, I'm going to help them. It's, no, this person's in the image of God, and like, I want to raise them up however way I can possibly, even if it's just physically in this moment. I don't know, it's just kind of some of my process sometimes. But being made in the image of God is really important. Verse 6 says, you've given dominion over the works of your hands. you put all things under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, birds of heaven, fish of the sea, whatever passes under the sea. This list is more than just domesticated animals, right? Like, we don't really have a lot of power. Like, I can't tell a fish to sit or, like, come here to the boat. Otherwise, fishing would be way easier, right? <laughs> We're not just talking about domesticated creatures. 
There is an importance, I think, stressed here in a little bit. Well, no, I think it is. Like, we have a responsibility and something we need to care for our planet. Now, this topic gets a little funky, right? Because, well, not to get too into it, but we have a two-party political system and everything gets really difficult. Take politics aside for a sec, if you can. But we should care for the planet in a sense. We should have, not that we are ruled by the planet, but we have dominion in a way of we have been set to care. We should care for where we are. And honestly, that's really hard in a society that, I don't know, uh, will always choose, seems to always choose convenience every time. You know, we choose convenience versus thinking of the future or thinking of that effect. Driven by funds, driven by money, that gets really difficult. But I don't really have much to say on that other than you should have kind of a, a care. Okay. Kind of cruise through that way. Now, I really want to talk about this. Let's turn to Matthew 21. Let's just go, verse 16 is the important one. And um, In context, what's going on right here is Jesus just rolled in on a donkey and everyone started taking their coats off and laying on the floor singing Hosanna to Jesus. And uh, that happens and basically, that's, that's that one, right? So chapter 21, verse one is a triumphal entry. He tells the disciples, hey, go get me a donkey, get this cold, bring it in, we're gonna put stuff on, I'm gonna sit on his back, we're gonna triumphantly roll into town. And they get there and people spread their cloaks on the road, as verse 8. Others cut branches from trees and spread them out on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Boom, hyperlink. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they entered Jerusalem and the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. They're close. He's much more than the prophet, right? This is awesome. So they're saying this. It's Hosanna in the highest. Jesus is here. This is amazing. Next thing in my Bible, verse 12, is Jesus goes into the temple and starts <laughs> cleansing it. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. <laughs> specifically pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Do you hear what these kids are saying? You got them all confused. They don't know what they're talking about. And what does Jesus say? Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? This is, uh, this is super cool. I wish I was better at talking to people because I get you guys more pumped about this. But in my mind, this is rad. So Jesus comes in the town, right? This triumphal entry he comes in. Immediately, he's like, this temple is a disaster. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. Flips everything. It literally says, oh, we're sinking down here. <laughs> Verse 15, he says, and the children crying out in the temple. Like, how many more, like, buzzwords do you need? So all these, the children are crying out in the temple. Hosanna to the son of David. And the scribes also, what, what else can we say about scribe? We call them Bible nerds, Bible scholars, educated people. Essentially what you want to say is these are the guys that knew the scripture inside and out and they should have known. They should have known. And then you have all these, it literally says children crying out Hosanna in the highest. And, um, and the scribes are like, what are you doing? This whole thing we've had set up is getting all jacked up. People are flipping tables. The guy at the pigeon table doesn't have a place to sell now. 
you know? What are you doing? And Jesus is like, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, mic drop. And I guarantee you, I would imagine um, that that would probably cue something up in those guys' brain. They'd be like, whoa, huh. I just think that's so cool, guys. Like here, I'll just, I'm just gonna read some. But yeah, he's like, here are the Bible experts of the day. And Jesus, in one simple quote of a psalm, puts them in their place. He basically says, you have knowledge without faith and you have been blinded by it so much you can't see that your Messiah is literally right here in front of you. And the people who are infants in their faith or don't have this knowledge can see it as bright as day. Right? How many times have you had like a child or a baby just drop some crazy truth and you're like, oh, that is good. <laughs> or have you ever had like your kid call you out? Maybe, I don't know. Not maybe in a mean way, but just in a way they're just like, oh, dad, that's not right. And you're like, oh. You know, Jesus' ministry was, he had a really special place for children. You remember when uh, there's a talk of all the kids are wanting to come spend time with Jesus and the disciples are like, Jesus doesn't have time for you, okay? And Jesus says like, no, let them come. Multiple times, Jesus says, you guys need to have childlike faith. I don't know, it's almost like it's wired into the system. When like every time a child drop some little bit of wisdom. They don't quite get it, but they kind of get it, right? They have that childlike faith. I don't know. Remember this. Remember that. Sometimes knowledge can kind of blind you a little bit of the, of the truth, of that specialness, the heart of it. So pretty sweet. Um, <clears throat> You know what things is cool too is I think this is like this psalm predicts or prophesies the future in a sense of the new type of kingdom. The new kingdom, I guess, in which we would read about when Paul writes like talks about like weaknesses, like God using our weakness, God using the weak to overturn the world on itself. God Jesus taking twelve disciples who our blue collar workers, right? They're fishermen and tax collectors. They're kind of just meh, probably people socially, people you wouldn't really look to for like deep biblical truths or guidance. He uses those 12 guys to just shake up the world. I think this is the new kingdom and I think this is what that Psalm is talking about. Like I'm gonna use babies and infants to just bring strength and redeem the world. I think, I just, that's what I imagine here, right? Do you guys see that? Do you guys kind of feel that a little bit? Now, some it's really fun to kind of wrap this up a little bit. I don't know if I want to wrap up right away, but Hebrews, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter two. Five through nine, we're gonna, we're gonna read, I'll just read five through nine for you right now. Uh, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of, which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. <clears throat> I wonder where this comes from. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, putting everything in subjection under his feet, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while was, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He kind of just, the author of Hebrews just kind of makes some little adjustments. I'll just say tweaks. I don't know. 
I tried to listen to some really smart guys talk about like why is this like just a little different wording than Psalms? You know, like it's not copy paste. And I'd love to give you a really good answer, but basically they said it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> but what they do, in a sense, they make some little word adjustments to bring a little bit more depth, right? When you read it in that way, and they just do some small stuff of changing it, like he was brought a little lower than the angels. The concept of like, not only is this psalm a really good example of us being made in the image of God and how important that is, but also Jesus stepped down from his high place to be with man, right? And that's the story, that's the gospel. Now we messed up. Right? We're supposed to have dominion over the world. Watch it, and we sinned. And now we just, we try. But I mean, we just struggle, we're fallen. But when Jesus came, he did it. That's what this says, that's what Hebrews says. He said he's crowned with glory and honor because of the sufferings, the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus tasted all our deaths. That's something interesting to consider, just that phrase, that Jesus tasted your death. How incredible. So, by doing that, I think we get a taste a bit of the kingdom right now, right? We're not what I would describe, it's not the end times or when Jesus comes back to bring his reign where we really get to experience it. But we get a taste. You know, we still get to see God use weak people to do great things for his, his plan. <clears throat> That's what I got for the psalm, but I want to say one last thing. One last, I'm not even going to say soapbox. This is good. Um, weakness is awesome. I just want to make sure that we don't use weakness as an excuse. Because though David talks and writes a lot about his weakness, David was a ferocious person. David understood his strength was from the Lord, he, but he also understood his weaknesses, but he's still ferocious. And he was, we are empowered to do something as well. Like, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And David, I mean, you read, like, all the conquests he did. The man was a warrior. I just don't want to get in the habit of, no, this is hard. I'm weak. It's, we're not moving on. Like, weakness... I don't know how else to say it, guys. Like, if we don't overcome, if we don't add some of God's power to that weakness, then we're just, we've missed the opportunity. we miss missed the potential, and I don't want to do that. I mean, I get it. Sometimes it's hard to overcome anxieties or take that leap of faith or that step. But, like, I think Christians should be go-getters. The Christian walk is, is, is a balance in my mind. The balance of like my strength, everything is from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the other side, I'm like, but I still got to go get some. Like, I still got to go work hard. I got to like, like, if you want to actually read your Bible diligently, discipline is tough. Right? I don't know. Just a quick, just a quick example. I just want to speak into that. I feel like maybe you... Don't struggle with that. You're like, no, duh. Yeah, I need to be like hard worker. Cool. Great. Keep, keep pressing on. I just think I see from a generation of like people, I think that can easily like, this is hard. It's not my thing. I'm not pressing on. And I know that's super vague, but I feel like if you feel that, um, I just want to say like practice ferocity, empowered in the Lord, knowing that he has a plan for you. He wants you to go out and get, get some stuff done in his name. So I hope that helps a little bit. I don't know. But yeah, 
That's great, huh? Sometimes you read like the Psalms and you're like, how did we get to like, I just love that Jesus like mocked the scribes with a Psalm. I don't know why I like that, but I think it's awesome. So anyway, let's pray. Thank you for being here. This was fun. So Heavenly Father, thank you for today. I just, I'm grateful that um, people showed up. You know, that people, whether they're in the building or they tuned it online. Sometimes tuning it online is just as hard because there's so many other things distracting. Lord, I thank you that people devoted time here, devoted to hear your word. Lord, thank you that your word is alive and your Holy Spirit, you, Holy Spirit, desire for the, for the word of God to penetrate into our hearts, to dig deep, to make an impact. God, we pray that that would be the case. Lord, we lift up everyone here, just that we'd be of good health. Lord, that we would keep our minds set on you and aware of our families or the people that things you've given to us to watch over, that we wouldn't get too caught up in things that are outside of our realm, like judgment. Lord, we lift up our kids, that you would watch over them that we'd be diligent to raise them in your word, Lord, so that they would know the truth, God. Thank you for tonight. I pray that you get all the glory. Pray us all in Jesus' name, amen. All right, good night.